I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to message number two in this series, Heart to Heart in the Holy of Holies. You know, there are so many things about this series that that really just excite me and bring back these incredibly passionate uh, memories of seeking God. The, uh, the times in my life when I've been so hungry for the Lord, wanted to connect with him, wanted to contact with him. And I know probably all of you are a lot like me. The first time I read Psalm 91, and I, and I found this phrase where it referred to the secret place, man, I am telling you something inside me just came alive. I thought, I thought whatever that secret place is, I want to know it. I want to find it. That's where I want to meet with God. Well, you know, there's a whole lot of, I think, very legitimate concepts of what the secret place is. Uh, and so, so I don't think I can narrow this down to any one particular thing, but here is one of the key things that we do know about the secret place or about those people who met with God secretly. It's not talking about meeting with God secretly in such a way that nobody else knows about it. That's not the whole, that's not the concept of a secret place, but, as, but in the secret place, it seems that the most a important concept is two people talking about things that are secret, that are private between those two individuals. Now, I'm telling you, of all the things that's lacking in the body of Christ today, there may be few things more than the wisdom of God. It was kind of interesting uh, in the book of James, it tells us that whenever we're, you know, that when we're being tempted, when we're being tested, when we're being tried, when we're being scrutinized, that... Um, uh, you know, we should, first of all, we should never, ever, ever, ever say that it's God. But it's kind of interesting. We are not instructed in the book of James to seek a miracle, to, to try to find some supernatural way of resolving this problem. Instead, it says that we should seek wisdom. Now, wisdom is the practical application of truth. And you know, I think that's one of the things that seems to be so missing in the body of Christ. I think that we, I think that we have an incredible uh, body of truth. I think that there's a lot of people that I even disagree with doctrinally somewhat. That honestly, the problem is not is not the doctrine. The problem is the application. What does it look like when you begin to to uh, uh, apply something? And so. And so in every situation, now this is my understanding, I'm, I'm not saying this is all there is to it, I'm not saying I have the only answers to this, but I am telling you this, the Lord is our shepherd, he is Jehovah Roha, he is the one who leads us in paths of righteousness. Now remember, paths of righteousness are not, are not just some vague, uh, indescript uh, place that we walk where it you know, because we're walking there that we, we are righteousness. You know, the word righteous is such an incredibly rich word. The word righteousness actually gets into one of, my, one of my favorite concepts of the word righteousness is as it should be. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 12, 28, it says, it says that uh, in this path uh, of, of righteousness, there is life and there is no death. So the way it should be when we're walking in the paths of righteousness is we should be experiencing the life of God. That should be that should be our new normal. And I don't think necessarily that experiencing the life of God is all about having God supernaturally intervene in our situation as much as it is to have God whisper into our heart and not only show us how to apply the truth, but then give us the grace, the strength, the power of the Holy Spirit, however you determine to say it, uh, to be able to walk in it, to be able to fulfill it. So, so it seems that, that there is this place, if you will, where we can make a heart-to-heart -heart connection with God, where in this place we talk with God about what we're going through, we discuss things with God, we we listen to God, we, we pray, we share, we're open, and, and God will give us the leadership we need to walk in paths of righteousness and paths of how it should be. He will lead us beside still waters. He will make us a lie down in green pastures. His rod and his staff will comfort us. 
In other words, we get to experience all the provision, all the protection of God when we are walking in these paths of, of righteousness. Now, when, you, when we look at the whole concept of this secret place, the, the model that we're looking at is uh, the tabernacle. Or actually, originally there was a tabernacle, and, and actually we're looking more specifically at the temple. Now, one of the reasons we're looking at the temple is because there are some specifics about the temple that are somewhat different than uh, than what we were what we would be thinking of if we if we looked at the tabernacle. The temple, Solomon's temple, actually presents to us concepts of the inner workings of our inner man, how we connect to God uh, uh, intimately, uh, that are somewhat different than than the tabernacle. And I don't want to go into all those differences. Some of them, some of the issues are not that they're different. It's just that there are some things that are explained in the construction of the temple and the way the temple was laid out that those things were not as clearly explained uh, in the tabernacle. But I want you to understand when you think about when you think about the tabernacle that Moses set up in the wilderness, one of the things we know for sure about that tabernacle is that that tabernacle was built after, a, after and it was modeled or copied the tabernacle that exists in heaven. Now that's a, that's a phenomenal thing to think that God says, "I'm going to get you to build something, a place for." And the whole purpose of the tabernacle was, "This is a place." where I want to meet with you. Now, that's something we have to understand about God. God has always been the one who initiated uh, interaction between himself and his creation, the human race. And so and so he, he initiated the tabernacle because he wanted there to be a, 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 a place and a way that man could come and meet with him. And unlike the pagan gods, you know, with the pagan gods, they were always bringing sacrifices. They were cutting themselves. They were they were uh, uh, sacrificing their children to the fires of Moloch. They were they were yes they were sacrificing animals. All of this kind of thing. But here is the primary difference. I mean, there's all, there, there's a lot of other differences. But one of the primary differences is in paganism or in the occult, all sacrifices that are given, all gifts that are given, all all acts of attrition that are given are given to try to force the deity that you worship to draw near to you. Well, God said he's holy. Well, when he says that he's holy, he's saying, I am uncommon. I am not like any of the gods you've worshipped. I'm not like any of the gods you saw in Egypt. I'm not like any of the gods you've ever heard of. And so no matter what the similarities may be, uh, you're never doing these things for the same reasons that the pagans are. And the primary difference is that we are never giving sacrifices. Even in the Old Testament, Old Testament sacrifices were not given to compel or to force God to draw near to you and come and meet with you. One of the Hebrew words that makes reference to the sacrifices does mean an offering. It's called a draw near offering. And a draw near offering, it is never about getting God to draw near to you. Because when there's a separation between, between a, a human being and God, the separation always occurs in, in the person uh, who is moving away from God because their conscience is violated, because they because they don't trust God, because they don't believe uh, what what God says. How many? I mean, how many times as a new believer? And I'm sure you don't do this now, but can you think back to the times as a new believer when you would have some kind of personal failure, something would go wrong in your life, and you would feel very distant from God? Well, you know, people used to come to me as a pastor and talk to me about that. And I'm saying, well, uh, you are only distant from God in your mind. You know, the book of Colossians tells us that, uh, that we were alienated in the first chapter by our wicked works in our mind. In other words, this is not something that existed in the mind of God. This is something that exists in our own mind. And the degree 
of separation between us and God uh, is always about whether or not we trust God, whether or not we trust his promises, whether or not we believe what he said when he said, I'll always be there. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never abandon you. And so I would always tell people as a pastor, you know, the, this distance that you have or that you're experiencing between you and God is your imagination. It is your corrupt conscience. It is the guilt and the shame that you feel over whatever it is that you have done. God has not changed because of what you have done. You have changed because of what you have done. And so the whole idea of all of the sacrifices, the whole idea of, of approaching God was not to come and to compel God to, to uh, take action. Uh, God was already taking action. God was already working by his spirit to, to draw us near to him. So when we think about this secret place, we're, we're, we're talking about coming to a place even when we don't feel like God is going to be there, even when our heart condemns us, even when our behavior condemns us. And I'm not trying to say just live any way that you want to live, because eventually you can do so much damage to your heart. Your heart can get so hard that honestly, you use your you lose your capability to be able to even sense the presence of God. You do not want to get in that place. You do not want to get in a place where your heart is hard or where your understanding is darkened. And all those things, they they can happen. But uh, like Paul said, I, I'm convinced of better things about you. You're not listening to a broadcast like this because you're trying to find a way to get by with sin. You're listening to a broadcast like this because you are seeking ways to feel uh, constantly connected, intimately, deeply connected to God. Now, so, so we've got this pattern. You know, one of the things I love about God is that God reveals himself in patterns. But when we look at the Bible and we see the big picture of the Bible, we start realizing from the Garden of Eden all the way to the book of Revelation, we can understand God without getting confused and without having a lot of contradictions when we look for the patterns. And one of the patterns that we see is even when man uh, violates everything that there is to know about God, God is always the one that is seeking to draw him back. God doesn't need to be drawn to him. We need to be drawn back to God. And so, and so we've got an entire Bible. We've got thousands of years of history that says God wants to meet with you. God wants you to come before him. You know, in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, it says this. I, I just love this passage of scripture. I know many of you do too. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, starting the 19th verses. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, which is the holiest of all, or the holy of holies, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Man, and I know so many of you have, have clung to this passage of Scripture many times. You know, I, I always tell people, when, when you're coming before God in your time of need, and in the book of Hebrews, he does talk about coming before God in his time in our time of need. Our time of need is generally when we are wavering, when we're ready to give in, when we're almost crushed, when we're ready to give up, or when we've already failed. So when we're about to fail, or when we've already failed, that is our that is our greatest time of need. And but this is the time where we have to say, well, wait a minute. I don't my entrance to the secret place with God, my entrance to this connection with God is not about my performance. It's about Jesus' performance. It's about the fact that he opened the way. He paid the sacrifice. Now, when you would go into the Holy of Holies uh, in the tabernacle or in the temple, when you would go into the Holy of Holies, you would pass through a veil. And it was a very thick veil. And as many of you know, when Jesus died on the cross, uh, we have a, a record of the fact that the veil 
going into the Holy of Holies was ripped, torn into from the top to the bottom, signifying that it wasn't man who tore this, but it was God who tore this. It was God who opened way because no more was the veil going to be just a a, a colorful uh, a curtain of, of wool linen woven together. Mm-hmm. Now, now the veil through which we enter to go into this secret place with God is the veil of Jesus so or, or the flesh of Jesus. So if I'm passing through the flesh of Jesus, this means that I am in him. This means I am going into him. This means the secret place with God is, is not a tabernacle, is not like it was in the temple, is not like it was in the Old Testament. I am entering into the presence of God in Christ Jesus. I The veil has been torn. I have entered into him. He is my ark. He is my covenant. He is my everything to God. And I am entering into God. And I'm and I am, I'm not trying to get him to draw near to me. He is there. He is waiting on me. He's ready for me. He stands, always stands ready, the Holy of Holies, uh on the on, on the mercy on the mercy seat, on his throne, to draw us near to him and to pour his love out on him. Now, one of the things I want to talk about real quickly, and let me let me remind you, I have, with this uh, video series, I have an eight-message audio series that we are offering at a, at a special price because I really, really, really want you to have this. So you may want to download that right now, start listening to these jointly, the video series which is always free, and the audio series for those of you who are seeking to build your life on something just a little bit deeper uh, and and really take the deep dive into connecting heart-to-heart with God in the the Holy of Holies. Now, when when we, one of the key things that I want to, I want to come to today is that entering into the Holy of Holies and going through the veil of the flesh of the Lord Jesus is tantamount to passing through what we might think or consider or or even call a secret portal, a secret doorway into this place with God. Now, here's the one of the most incredible things about entering this place with God. There are so many things about entering into the presence of God that are absolute. We can find them in the scripture. We have these incredible descriptions with him. But entering heart to heart with God intimately, this is this is more about relationship than it is formality. This is more about the fact that we are coming together, that we are opening ourselves up. We're holding nothing back. We're we're not telling each other lies. We're not covering up anything. We're dealing with anything that would that would hurt our relationship. And so and so. It's very interesting that the Bible reveals some things about entering into the presence of God and really the outcome of entering into the presence of God. And this is all revealed in, in dozens of places because, like I say, God always reveals himself by patterns. So he shows this in many ways. But I'm going to go back to the Hebrew alphabet. You know, the Hebrew alphabet, and I've shared this with, with, with many of you before, the Hebrew alphabet, every single letter in the Hebrew alphabet actually has its own individual definition. And so when you're doing translation work in the Hebrew, you not only you not only come up with the general meaning of a word, and then you look at that word in context, where it was stated, how it was stated, how, how it was used. You look at, obviously, you look at the mood and the tense and the voice and all of those things that you would do when you're trying to understand communication. But uh, but one of the things that you would do is you would look up the definition of the, th- the three root letters of the, when you take, the, in other words, you take the root word and the root word usually has three letters. And so you would look up the individual definition of every one of those letters. And so you have a word, and this word has these letters in it. So, 
So, so you've got a general concept of what this word means. You understand what this word means in context. You understand the mood, the tense, the voice, all of those kinds of things. And, but now you actually go to the next step, and the next step is saying, okay, what is the definition of each one of the letters and the root word? And so my, my understanding of what a word is, might mean has to be uh, in harmony with the definitions of these letters and the root word. So in the in the Hebrew alphabet, and when you learn the alphabet, you don't just learn the letters because this really the, uh, the Hebrew alphabet is not really just about phonics. The Hebrew alphabet is based really on pictures and and messages and concepts that are conveyed through these through these pictures. So I'm just going to go through the first few letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and then we're going to talk about this and what this has to do with entering into this sacred place. Uh, it starts with, the Hebrew alphabet starts with the letter Aleph, and then it goes to the word Bet, and then it goes to the word Gimel, and then it goes to the word Dalit, and then it goes to the word Hey. Now we could keep going all the way through the 22 letters of the, the Hebrew alphabet. Now, I'm going to give you really a, a very quick uh, understanding of these letters. I'm not going to go into them in detail because it, it gets very, very extensive. But, you know, one of the things about the, the word olive, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the word olive is a picture of a message from God, a man, a human being, uh, and another message of God. And the whole concept, or the very first concept behind this very first letter, is that the Aleph is when heaven and earth are united because man, God and man, uh, or heaven and earth, actually are combined and come into, into function because man is using the authority that he has been given by God to establish uh, the will of God here on planet Earth. So the first letter starts with uh, the fact that it is, it is a call to, for us to unite ourselves with God and to become one with him and establish heaven here on earth. Now, the next letter, the bet, is it can mean house or household, or it can mean heart. And the, the concept of a house, the concept of a heart are very, very similar. And so many times by, by taking a, a word that we know is referring to the heart and thinking about it like a household, what, what, what would this look like if I was talking about a household? then we come to understand some things that we would not understand. And so, and so God's intention starts with, all truth starts with the intention to harmonize man and God, heaven and earth. That's where it all starts. And it all starts because of what is happening in a person's heart. What do they believe in the heart? Now, the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet is called the Gimel. The Gimel is a really interesting letter. The Gimel is like a drawing of a camel, and it presents the idea of, of the camel running to find the person who needs rescuing and bringing all of the resources that that, that, that person needs. And, and so God is always the one that's coming. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is not just the one who provides. He is the one who sees in advance and then provides. And then, uh, then the next uh, letter in the Hebrew alphabet is the word Dalit, which the Dalit can mean a, an opening, a portal, or a gate. And this talks about entering into an entirely different dimension, and you are no longer in this natural dimension. You are no longer functioning in this natural dimension that is limited by time and space. And now you've gone through this portal and we know that that portal is in fact the door of our heart. When we enter in to the holy place through the door of our heart, we enter into a totally different realm. Now, what's really interesting, remember the, the, the tabernacle of Moses was a copy of, uh, of the tabernacle that was in the heavenly holy of holies. Now we could stop right there and we could say, okay, so, so this is all about the heavenly holy of holies. Well, it's not all about the heavenly holy of holies 
Because even after the resurrection and even after all that Jesus did to bring us salvation, then the Apostle Paul in the book of Corinthians starts telling us that we are the temple of God. So suddenly he starts saying, well, oh, oh, wait a minute. There was a tabernacle back there, and this tabernacle was a type. It was a shadow. And you, you think, okay, it's a type and a shadow of the, of the tabernacle that's in heaven. But then, even after Jesus has been raised from the dead, we realize, oh, wait a minute. The tabernacle in heaven is really a type of us as a tabernacle, which means that the Holy of Holies is not in heaven. The Holy of Holies is in our own inner man. So when we go through the portal, which is the heart, and this is where we pass from, from the holy place to the most holy place. This is where we pass through this portal, through this gateway, where inwardly uh, we are entering into the most intimate, private place we could ever enter into with God. And there is where we experience the hay. Now, the hay is a very interesting word because the word hay represents the breath of God or the life of God. And it is a concept of God breathing life into the person that he is speaking to. In other words, God's words do not simply convey information. They convey the life, the grace, the power to live that information. And so every time we go to encounter God in the secret place, every time we go to encounter God uh, in the Holy of Holies, every time we uh, determine to pass through the veil of the flesh of the Lord Jesus and enter into this deep intimacy with God, it's never just so that we can have a conversation with God. Now, that conversation, yes, we're going to have it. We're going to talk about it. God's going to instruct us. God's going to show us things. But at the end of the day, the most powerful thing that's going to happen to us in our intimacy with God is we're going to experience the breath of God. Just like God changed Abraham, Abram's name from Abram to Abraham, what was the difference? He, what the difference is the hay. The, word, the name Abram did not have the hay in it. Abraham had the hay in it, which meant this is where God breathes life in this situation. Same thing with Sarah. I want you to understand that God wants to meet with you very intimately and very personally, and he wants to breathe new life in you every single day, every single breath, every time you meet together. Be sure and, and share this message with people. And listen, jump back in here with me. We got a lot we're going to talk about, and you're going to love all of it. Blessings to you.